Welcome to a new series. I'm National Master Brian Tillis, and this is Great Games in Chess History. I've been wanting to do a series like this for a while, and to me, I always enjoy seeing my students' faces light up as I show them games that I have on my list. There, there are many, many games that once you get to a certain strength as a chess player, you can really begin to appreciate the profound nature of the beauty of some great games in chess. And we're going to start things off with looking at a game by Adolf Anderson, and it's from 1851. Now, Anderson is generally considered to be the world's leading chess player from 1851 to 58, and from a technical standpoint, the unofficial world champion of chess. Uh, this particular game that we're going to be looking at is acclaimed as an exemplar of the romantic style of play from 19th century chess, where rapid development and attack were considered the most effective way to win games. Gambits, man. Gambits and counter gambits were often offered, and in the time period, not accepting them would be considered a slight or ungentlemanly. And material was often held in contempt. These games with the rapid attacks and counterattacks are often entertaining to review, but some of the moves would no longer be considered optimal by modern standards, but you know, it's like watching a modern movie. Not everything can be absolutely perfect. We're, we're gonna miss certain things. Adolf Anderson though, definitely deserves recognition and we're beginning our journey of great games in chess history here in 1850 because this seemed to be the first time period in chess history where a systematic study of the game was taking place and the game was evolving and we'll see with our our next player further evolution of the culture of chess and knowledge of the game let's jump right in E4, Fisher set it, best by test. These guys like quick attacks, and almost all of them played E4 back in the day. And after E5, we have ourselves the King's Gambit. And this is a, a common move for Anderson. He offers up a pawn in exchange for that rapid development. And it's not often we define what a gambit is. We just say King's Gambit, Queen's Gambit, Evan's Gambit. Well, a gambit is giving up material in order to get more time. And that's the interplay in the dynamics of chess. There are three advantages in chess. Time, material, and quality. We all know material. If I'm up a queen, it helps a lot. But what about time and quality? If you give up the center, it makes it harder for you to develop your pieces. Your pieces will have less quality. Mine will have greater quality. So for this interplay of trade and material, you are taking an extra move to grab the pawn on f4. So I am getting both time and quality for my pieces while limiting yours. How much is material worth? That question is the reason gambits have been played all throughout recorded chess history. Bishop c4, and now c queen h4 check. Brings to mind, never bring your queen out early if she's going to be kicked around and attacked. You're going to see quickly move two, the ladies being brought out. And it may be justified in this position, but you're having to follow up after grabbing the pawn on f4 with playing a move like queen h4 and you're walking a tightrope already with black you're going to have to have a lot of accuracy king f1 best way to get out of the check and now b5 
And this is definitely a move that cannot be recommended in modern chess called the Brian Counter Gambit. And this was deeply analyzed by Kazertsky and sometimes bears his name. And, you know, it's not a sound move. We just take it. <laughs> Knight f6. Knight f3, getting some time off the queen. Never bring the queen out early if she's going to be attacked and you're going to lose time. And after queen h6, d3 was played in the main game, which we will see, but knight c3 is widely considered stronger by modern standards. And after c6, bishop c4, d6, and d4, white's gotten what he wants out of the position. The big center, pressure on f4, and all that for a pawn. An interesting and dynamic position. But after queen h6, d3, black continues to put this vigilant focus on moving the same pieces over and over. And in the long term, this is going to cost him. Knight h4 is played, eyeing this wonderful f5 square to bother the queen further. And notice how the d7 pawn is pinned from our bishop on b5, so there is no simple d6 covering f5. Queen g5. Now, knight f5 protecting our bishop. g6 is, is definitely uh, a better move than what's played in the game, but c6 is starting to really kick off the fun. Let's get started. g4. And, of course, en passant is going to result in a lost woman. We can't have that. So, knight f6. Hitting the g-pawn again. Simply defend it. So, we are giving up our first piece. But, black should strongly consider at least h5. And try to get out of this mess in this way. But... Still a very dynamic position. Black is very, very much behind in development and time. In the main game, though, greed was the letter of the day, and he takes the B. Now the queen is losing further time. And after queen f3, we're pressurizing that pawn on f4, looking to take. And the undevelopment takes place. So the only piece that black has in the game is the queen at this point. And this is, this is looking dirty fast. Grab. Now, knight c3. And legitimately, it looks like white is cheating in this position. Every piece developed <laughs> and in the attack. Bishop c5, hitting the rook. We don't care. We want more pieces in this. Knight d5, bothering this queen. Queen takes. Now both rooks are hit. And this next move is definitely falls under the category of one of the most well-known or beautiful moves in chess history. Bishop d6. And with this move, white offers to sacrifice both of his rooks. Gary Kasparov commented on the position that the world of chess would have lost one of its crown jewels if the game had continued in really any other way. The bishop d6 move is surprising because white is willing to give up so much material for this well-calculated result. And I love it. So it's a good question. If you're a pause the type of video type of person, this is the moment. What would you do with black here and why? Try to calculate deeply. All right. In the main game, one of the rooks was taken. <laughs> but the wrong rook was taken. The best practical move is queen takes a1 check. And Steinitz recommended this move in 1879. So he had pretty decent analytical skills. The first world champion, official, by the way, King E2. 
And now queen b2, not grabbing a second piece, only now taking the rook. And e5 is judged roughly equal by modern engines. Very interesting. So it's a crazy position. So coming back to the main game, bishop d6. Bishop takes g1 was played. And from this point on, if you've never seen the game before, I would strongly suggest pausing after each move and trying to see the full tactical combination here. All right, hopefully you've taken time to pause. White starts off with e5, giving up this rook. Now king e2. The king is safe. There are no checks. And black is worried about c7, so knight a6. And this is the final nail in the coffin. It is white to play and win. See if you can find the entire combination. All right. Hopefully you paused and you were able to see mate. Knight takes g7 check, forcing the king to d8. Now that difficult swish and zug to find. Queen f6 check with the queen sacrifice. This deflects the knight from defending e7, which ends beautifully in checkmate. At the end, black is ahead so much material. I mean, a considerable amount of material. But material isn't the only advantage in chess, and it doesn't help black. White's been able to use his remaining pieces, the two knights and the bishop, to force this very, very elegant mate. And this begins our journey into chess history from an amazing game by Anderson.